Thank you and good afternoon. I'm Chris Moody. And I'm Christian Howard. Uh, I'm at C. Howard Run on Twitter. Uh, so we wanted to start with a little bit about um, creators and community. Uh, so just looking at the sort of statistics out there, uh, these numbers obviously tell some sort of story. And uh, according to the stories out there, there are people like us, the people who look like us, who make games like us, are rare. Um, and not simply the people working in the industry, but the, the sort of thoughtful, creative engines who think of the types of things that we're thinking of. Apparently, we are rare. Um, and we know this to be untrue, because the work that we're doing has shown us time and time again that, as Stacy pointed out, there are these really multifaceted, creative individuals, kids and adults, who love these ideas, who are really interested in making impactful games, and seeing games as something that changes the community. Um, and so we choose to create sort of in spite of these stories, and we want to uh, find the means to actually make new stories. So, just a, a quick quote. Um, sometimes talking about, uh, as Stacy brought up, this uh, position of reluctantly being thrown in as a mentor, as somebody that people who want to make games or people who are starting to make games uh, look up to, and the sort of responsibility of that. As creators, we carry with us many stories that we might call origin stories or creation myths. Uh, these personal legends and obsessions uh, that haunt us long after the first encounter. And so Chris and I and uh, our other studio mates have lots of different creation stories. We have lots of different origin stories uh, and lots of different people that have given rise to those stories, people, events, and just random circumstances. Uh, sometimes those origin stories are things that attach themselves to us unwittingly. Uh, sometimes they're not things that we choose, and sometimes they are. So together, Chris and I are part of a studio called Hidden Level Games, which is based here in New York. Uh, and together, we represent a very wide array of different identities, uh, different backgrounds, different ways of thinking. Um, and these are just a few of them. Um, I wanted to kind of just point out some of the people that in and around our interests in games, in literature, in art, in philosophy, in science fiction, uh, food, tech, and everything else, some of the people that have come to inspire us. Um, they look like this. Uh, these people are just sort of playing around. Does anybody know who that guy is with uh, this really cool helmet? That is Africa Bambada. All right, so if we're talking about godfathers of hip hop. Uh, on this uh, little smattering of pictures here, we have Nigeria, we have Cuba, we have Puerto Rico, we have Haiti, we have um, First Nations, we have uh, America, and we have artists, writers, uh, performers, we have game makers. So a lot of different types of people that sort of inspire the creations that we are making. Um, so if we're carrying around this kind of vast body of inspiration, um, what do we do with that, and what is designing dangerously for us? So that position of being thrown reluctantly into mentorship, uh, for us, comes with a lot of responsibilities. Of the things that we make, once they're thrown out into the world, um, become taken up, and luckily for us, have catalyzed a sort of community. So for us, designing dangerously kind of comprises uh, three or more maybe categories here. The first one we think of as fear and love. Um, so what we like to tell our students and what we like to tell ourselves is this is the creation without shame. Um, it's very easy to create something, not want it to go out into the world, not really want people to see it because you're so ashamed that it's not working, that it's not perfect. Um, so we try to instill in ourselves constantly in one another and in the people that engage with us um, this idea of not having to justify everything that's wrong with your work, but just creating. Creating and creating and creating again. Uh, so banishing from ourselves that idea of being an imposter amongst experts, which we find again and again in a lot of the students that we come across. The idea that they can't create because they haven't been raised in the same ways that a lot of other people have. Or they can't create because they haven't had uh, somebody who looks like them tell them that the things that they're making are important. Or just able to see 
an example of a role model who looks like them. Yes. We're just thinking that their ideas aren't good enough. And I think the ideas not being good enough is a huge, huge um, impediment to a lot of people just starting to create. Um, risk and reward. Um, there's no, there are no successes without some measure of risk. Um, if you want to be successful, you're going to go through some failures. Something that every successful person knows, but not something that those who haven't stepped out and tried know. Um, if you're going to do anything and you want to succeed at it, you have to be prepared to fall on the face and it's okay to fail. Also the idea of uh, questioning chaos and stasis. Um, what we talk about time and again with our students is any time you see an opportunity to question something, why not try it? See where it leads. Question all the chaotic elements around you, question all the sort of bland elements around you, um, and see what you can make out of that. Oftentimes, uh, responsibility comes out of this, out of questioning, um, and a sort of responsibility of being honest to yourself and honest to your communities. Community is a huge part of what we're trying to do. <coughs> in our young game makers and in ourselves. What is the responsibility that we have as producers to a community of people that look up to us, whether we want it or not? Um, and as designers, we hold a responsibility to lead when we can, be silent when we must, and listen wholeheartedly to communities in need. Um, there's a quote that I really love, and, and this talk, Designing Dangerously, is sort of a legacy um, of uh, several writers who I really love, Albert Camus and Edwidge Nanticat, and Edwidge Nanticat talking about what is the position of immigrant artists um, who have to create out of situations oftentimes that are extremely dangerous for them and the people around them, their loved ones. And several people on that sort of board of inspirations create dangerously. All of them create dangerously, but several of them have created despite the fact that their families have been attacked for certain things that they've created, that um, one, Chris Abani, for instance, who will come up a little bit later, uh, published his first novel at the age of 16 and was subsequently imprisoned in Nigeria because of this. Um, so Edwidge Dantagat, speaking about the sort of need to create dangerously, says, to create dangerously is also to create fear fearlessly, boldly embracing the public and private terrors that would silence us, then bravely moving forward even when it feels as though we are chasing or being chased by ghosts. So we wanted to give you guys a little brief narrative history of how Chris and I and our studio mates came together, uh, and this idea of creating dangerously and creating, wanting to sort of see people like us um, and see other representations like us in games. So this is actually a screen from the first game I ever made. Um, it's a very short platformer, basic objective is to escape the dungeon. And I love dungeon crawlers and games like Zelda and um, you know, might and magic and things like that. So, um, making something like this was natural for me, but, you know, this isn't the typical hero that you see in the game. Um, and, you know, it was important to me to see myself um, as the hero in a world where largely when I do see people who look like me, I'm the enemy, I'm being shot at, I'm dispensable. Um, that's, that's basically it. I'll just say I'm very happy to see this just because this is probably the first time I've ever seen this screenshot. <laughs> uh, so the idea of this sort of imagined representation of Chris and these magic powers up here at the top, it's just really exciting to me. <laughs> Players can actually code and play at the same time. They have uh, full access to a physics engine that we've exposed and as we move forward we're uh, making things more and more customizable so now players can um, you know, change the color of their little robot and we're moving more towards um, diversifying it more like this and you might recognize a number of uh, pop culture references uh, like we've got Super Mario, Batman, Chun li uh, Laura Croft, we've got Peter Griffin, uh, the guy from Minecraft, we've got any, anyone ever played any of the old like NBA Jam games or anything like that? You remember that Michael Jordan was never really officially in the game. He was also always number one. <laughs> and we've got the Incredible Hulk and uh, of our what do we call this guy? Big Data. Big Data. Big Data. <laughs> so moving from a space where. Um, 
Chris and I think the rest of us were creating games really for ourselves as sort of self-representational models to launch into the world so that other people can enjoy them, but really they were made for us and our friends. What we found with Beta, and Beta's uh, prime ability is that anything that he imagines he can create in the world. So what Beta does is it allows players to uh, simultaneously learn how to code, learn the logic of coding using a tweet size language um, that Chris and Errol, who's also one of our co-founders sitting down here in the front, uh, Chris and Errol made up, and it is a tweet size language called CodePop. So our players learn how to use CodePop, learn the logic of coding, and can also at the same time use that logic and use CodePop to develop the world around them. So, as you'll see in that, anything that you can imagine, any sort of uh, platform or actor or ball or water, anything, because this is a full physics engine as well, um, can really be rendered. And I think there's a very intimate connection between us as designers and the people who play the games, where we invite them to hack and to break the game as many times as they can, and then tell us about it. Every time uh, they learn something new or something breaks, we learn something and there's a direct correlation between them wanting things in the game and us producing new art, new abilities, and new objects. So building a sort of community, a community of betas and a community of um, beta lovers. We've gone into many different situations, um, and this is not out of the, out of the ordinary for the sort of um, communities that I think coalesce around beta. Um, we talk a little bit about this? So this is um, this is a picture from um, an event that we did. Um, I think we had over a hundred kids, one hundred fifty, or on the order of one hundred and fifty kids. Um, we didn't have, I'm not sure if we had quite enough computers, so you'll notice that some of them are paired up, or those may also be volunteers. But, um, <coughs> We came down and we had folks come from various school districts in the area, bring their children. Um, they all came in and built multiple games with Beta. Um, you'll see we have the big screen back in the back. We were up in the front and on stage, uh, kind of walking them through different exercises and then letting them let go and let go the, the tether from us, sorry, and just run with it and see where their imaginations took them. And we got. Um, a lot of games were made that day, a lot of code was written, and I feel that, um, you know, walking out of a workshop like this, the kids are certainly empowered uh, with a, a sense of digital authorship because they've, they've created a manifestation of their own making. Uh, you know, they've created a game, and that's an amazing feeling, especially the first time you do it. Um, I don't have the current numbers with me, but uh, I know that beta is being used in schools all over the country. Uh, we currently are also being used in the UK, uh, in Sweden, and in Canada as well. And we partner with a number of organizations, um, that's the Black Girls Code, Girls Who Code, um, probably uh, young game makers at some point work with them all. A lot of our people um, So. Thinking then about a few simple practices that have helped us refashion that sort of fear uh, into a productive catalyst. And really thinking through how do we mobilize a community of creators to take bold chances again and again despite the promise of failure. Not the sort of questions of failure, but telling students you will fail and it's okay, but you have to keep going. And you have to create as much as you possibly can, as often as you possibly can, and with as many intent to see this in the world, or as much intent as you possibly can. So how do we convince them that an intimate knowledge of life, yours and others, good and bad, is what makes us human? Um, one of the first things is that we talk about just hacking the world. Hack as much as you possibly can. I think a lot of people in this room probably grew up in a time and a space where we could pull things apart, break things, um, maybe get yelled at by parents for doing that, but we could still do it and enjoy it. Um, and it doesn't seem to happen as much these days. When I ask my students if they're taking apart their parents' radios, they just look at me like I'm insane. Um, we don't have uh, the same sort of easy notions of hacking games as well. Um, I grew up in an era where we could just kind of blow into our Nintendo cartridges, which I just found out after looking on the internet last night that is not the best way to do it. Yeah. You should not ever do that. 
But for us, it was this sort of legend, right? Like it was the myth of fixing it. That all you had to do was shake it. All you had to do was maybe run that little alcohol swab across it, and you could somehow fix your game, right? So we had this intimate relationship to the things around us. So we try and teach all the people who are playing our games get out into the world, just experience things, hack as much as you possibly can. And not just hardware, but software, hack your routines, hack languages, hack what you're learning, hack recipes, hack ideas. Break things apart, see how it unravels, put things back together in a new way that makes sense to you. Um, and we encourage our players to remix, transform, and really transcend the limitations of the world around them, and anything that we create. We don't want to be the point at which students stop. We want them to see a bar that has been set, and we want them to go well beyond that. This is um, the other couple screens from beta. Games have been made in beta, and um, this tagline is knowledge is power. And really, what you know, the point of this is to just draw inspiration from the world around you. Um, the game on the left is a game called Betacom, in which uh, you control beta, and your object is to make it to the top and save the little princess robot from the giant evil beta column storm balls down at you. Might sound a little familiar. Um, on the other side, we've got a game that looks a little bit like Pac-Man. Um, and, uh, you know, again, the inspiration is drawn from multiple sources, whether it's from other games, books, any form of media, really. Um, you got to get out there and soak everything up. Um, since I know we're running short on time, um, the idea of not designing in a bubble. Um, and this quote from Chris Abani, who was talking, I think at that point, about uh, Ubuntu, um, this um, sort of the philosophy around the word Ubuntu in South Africa. Uh, and he said that there's no way for us to be human without other people. So building a community that you can work with, building a community that supports you, fostering relationships with people who value your ideas and hold you accountable for your ambitions. Um, and really just asking, asking questions. I think it's a huge thing that our students take for granted and that a lot of people take for granted, is that you never know how much one question can change an entire creative process. Um, and I can give you an example from my students who for the past month have been designing games around the sort of experiences of women in their lives. Um, and after about a week and a half of ideating and prototyping and playtesting, and some of them had games that actually worked and were interesting, I stood there and I said, all right, so what if we just, you know, asked women in our lives what they wanted represented in games? How would that change our sort of process here? How would that change the types of ideas that we're throwing around? <coughs> um, and after hating me very vocally for a good five minutes or so, I sent them out with homework to go and have conversations. Just three simple conversations that had to last at least 10 minutes of these. And that the information that they call from that will actually turn into the next layer of prototyping and game design that they have in, um, this month, actually. Uh, so for us, where can dangerous game design lead? Um, just two ideas that we kind of wanted to throw around with you guys. Uh, so the first idea is Slave Prime, uh, which is essentially a runner style game featuring a future of slave as a protagonist. Um, and a game like this pays homage to the histories of women, men, and children marked as fugitives for expressing their freedom. Um, and you know, you see a lot of runner style games, um, but this to me is kind of the first paradigm that, to me, fit the genre. Um, and if I was going to make a runner game, this is what I would do. And your power would be things like throwing black pepper behind you to throw off the dogs, <laughs> or you know, jumping over a river to also fall. <laughs> Um, and then John Henry, I think uh, collectively as a studio we're all fans of John Henry, the sort of mythos and the legends of him. Uh, so looking at a rhythm based game that puts the player in control of the legendary steel driver as he faces down the steel driver, or the steel driver. Um, so, Codepop, on Codepops, <laughs> and we are out of time, but keep calm and coding.